All right, North Korea is certainly a conversation now. Let's get to it. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Our Friday broadcasts are always recorded on Thursday unless something crazy happens, but that's generally our schedule. So uh, we always remind you of that if because the subject that we're discussing ends up having some update. And right now, uh, hopefully, between the time that we recorded the show almost 2 o'clock on Thursday afternoon, uh, Kim Jong-un hasn't fired another ballistic missile somewhere. Uh, I don't know what kind of pace he's trying to set here, but this last one this week was... Uh, you know, after a little bit of a lull, and perhaps we all thought that things were getting a little bit better. I don't know what this, whether this ballistic missile firing this week uh, is a cause for a huge alarm, but our professor guest, uh, Mark Janess from the Naval War College, uh, will try to explain it to us as he so well does. But here's the latest that we had at midday on Thursday. <coughs> As North Korea's most advanced missile launched into the night sky, a beaming Kim Jong-un was clearly pleased with his regime's accomplishment. The Hwasong-15 rocket is the third ICBM launched by North Korea in the past six months. The dictator of North Korea made a choice yesterday that brings the world closer to war, not farther from it. At an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley issued a stark warning about what she calls North Korea's continued acts of aggression. If war comes, make no mistake, the North Korean regime will be utterly destroyed. The Trump administration is calling on China, North Korea's main trading partner, to entirely cut off the regime's oil supply. Little rocket man. President Trump made fun of Kim Jong-un during a speech outside St. Louis on tax reform. He is a sick puppy. But experts who have studied photos of the regime's new weapon are taking it very seriously. I think it's clear from the pictures that it's a more capable rocket than certainly than the last one we saw. David Wright of the Union of Concerned Scientists says he's surprised by how fast North Korea is advancing its missile program. I'm less skeptical than I might have been that they can uh, deliver a warhead to certainly the West Coast and maybe, uh, maybe larger parts of the United States. So I think the threat that they have been talking about uh, is, a, is a real threat at this point. You know, delivering one and executing, the, uh, being able to deliver one and executing the delivery are two very different things, obviously. Yes. Correct? Uh, Mark Janess here. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, your executive summary on this is? And then we'll deepen, then we'll go deep. His nuclear program is progressing. It's becoming much more assertive, and its lethality as well as its reach is increasingly of concern. So when you say the nuclear program is progressing, break it up for me, because my very rudimentary understanding of all this is you got to have a rocket in order to send the nuclear capability somewhere. Is his ballistic missile capability static, or is that, is, is, is that growing too? Are they building them, or are they acquiring them, or are they doing both? They are building them, and they have progressed from an intermediate range nuclear missile with a, you know, maybe a 1,200 to 1,500 mile range to potentially a, an intercontinental one that has a range of 8,200 miles that can reach both coasts of the United States. We have plenty. Oh, we have thousands. Right. Um, but the problem here is they can get it up into the atmosphere. It's when you put a nuclear weapon, you put it on the nose cone of a missile, and that nose cone has to be hardened enough so that it can withstand the heat generated when you go from the atmosphere into the target itself on the ground. And that is very problematic whether they have that. So that's something that uh, they, I don't believe they yet, yet have accomplished. But we had a fascinating conversation on the radio uh, the day of, uh, of the missile launch, uh, which I believe was Tuesday of this week. Uh, they already have atomic capability, correct? Yes. Define for me what they have and what they're trying to perfect. Okay. They have had for at least several years now atomic capability. An atomic bomb is a bomb that is caused uh, by fission, the splitting apart of atoms. And that is measured in thousands of tons of TNT. And it's what we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is a powerful weapon. But they claimed, and they, there is some evidence, that they had an underground test of a hydrogen bomb, 
which is created by the fusion of atoms that creates a monumentally more powerful explosion that is measured in megatons or millions of tons of TNT. Uh, so that is a dramatic technological leap on their part. And now Kim Jong-un is threatening to have another hydrogen bomb test somewhere in the Pacific. And if that happens, that's going to be a, a, a dangerous on many levels from environmental to political to military. You, know, you, you, you can't test a hydrogen bomb in a vacuum. No, you can't. You can, te you can test it deep underground, and that constrains the explosion as well as the radiation fallout. If you do so above ground, then that whole area is going to be contaminated. What now, space? We did this in the past, remember. We did this in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, we, had a, we eventually signed a treaty uh, that banned testing like that. How, do, how often did we used to test? Uh, more times than we want to admit. Right. Out in the Midwest? Yes, the Pacific Atolls. Right. And, and in the West, uh, the, the, the far West in the 1940s. Do we have, uh, you're not an environmentalist by trade, but do we have environmental fallout from all that testing decades ago? Uh, there, yeah, sure. A lot of people, matter of fact, the, the soldiers who were there when the testing occurred um, had a tremendously high rate of cancer afterwards. So there is some evidence. I remember that was atomic bombs that we were testing out in the West. All right, so let me see if I understand this. Atomic, hydrogen, nuclear. Are nuclear and hydrogen the same thing? Oh, yes. Okay, got it. And, and that creates nuclear, nuclear capability and hydrogen bomb capability are the same conversation. Yes, they are. Okay, and what, what remind me, remind everybody, what did we do in Hiroshima? How did we, we, we dropped that sucker. Yes, we did. From a plane. Yes, we did. This ain't gonna be dropped from a plane. No, this is gonna be this dropped is gonna, mm, This is gonna be a, a missile that's coming out of the atmosphere. Yes. And that missile goes, you know where our space station is? It goes way above our, where our space station is in the stratosphere. Uh, so this missile goes way high, high, high into space. And then it comes back down which makes hitting that missile with our anti-ballistic missile capabilities very problematic. And we've got plenty of those suckers. Plenty of? Those missiles. Yes. And the nuclear capability to go along with it. Oh, yes. On aircraft, on land, on everywhere. Yes. Russia has that capability. Yes, it does. Pakistan has that capability? It has land-based missiles, not anything else. China has that capability. China has mostly land-based missiles. Who else? Israel. Israel. Yeah, I mean, you have Pakistan, India, Russia, China, the United States, France, and Great Britain. From, from the sea, are we, Russia and us, that's it? Uh, does Russia uh, have as much from the sea as we do? It's possible China does. I'd have to look that up. Okay, so I'm just trying to get the landscape here. Uh, so, I mean, we, we talk, it's kind of funny, right? We talk about the North Korean thing as, oh, he's got the, this, We've, the free world has been carrying this weaponry around for quite some time. Yes. It's just a question of whether this guy ought to have it. Right. And then you have this whole, this, and don't misunderstand me, this is not a non-American question, but if you take somebody from Mars and bring them down to America, down to the planet, and you say, oh, okay, how come these same humans in America have all these missiles and the right to them, and these guys over here in Russia have the right to them, and these guys over here in China have the right, but this little guy here in North Carolina, North Korea is trying to get, and he can't have them, why? That's a question that they're asking. Yes, and the Iranians. And the rain, okay. And our answer to that is, remind me. Our answer to that is <laughs> that you can't be trusted with them. Um, number one. Number two, that the proliferation of nuclear weapons in and of itself is a dangerous thing for the world. The more nukes there are out there, the more likely it is to fall into the wrong hands of someone like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Are you worried that North Korea is... They're already at... This is the, we've talked about this before. They want to be recognized as part of the, of, of the family of nuclear-capable countries. Well, they already are. I mean, But we won't say it. They want us to say it. It's almost like a Sam Kinison bit. Say it! Right? They want us <laughs> to say it, right? And we won't say it. They no, Not say it so much as we want to 
Would they want us to formally accept them as a legitimate nuclear power, which is what we're not going to do? Because? Because Kim Jong-un is seen as too aggressive uh, and too potentially erratic but if to we, be trusted But if we recognize it. that status, you think he'd calm down? No, I don't. All right, we'll find out why when we come back. Stay with us. Yep, that's what one of those suckers looks like. Uh, truth be told, our anti-missile defense system, Professor Janest, is what, about 50% track record accurate? A little better, but not. When you're talking about nuclear weapons, it's, not, it's like horseshoes. You don't have to actually get the target. It has to be close. And if you get 60% of the missiles launched at you, you still have a devastating impact on land. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so Kim Jong-un... If we uh, recognize his status, he couldn't be trusted. Why? Well, because, look, there are two reasons to have nuclear weapons. And the first one is certainly what they're doing. They want, they have learned the lessons from the Iraq war, uh, from Bosnia, that if you do not have nuclear war weapons, the United States can come out and take you out. Um, and certainly the Libyans were a great case in this. So you can imagine Kim Jong-un, who knows that the United States doesn't you know, like him, uh, looks at what happened in Libya and Iraq and Afghanistan and says, I had to get nukes to protect my regime. And, but that's been the North Korean strategy for a long period of time. But there's another reason, and that is, once I have nukes, not only am I safe from the Americans, I can then use it to, as a weapon to expand my influence in the region. And I suspect that Kim Jong-un's long-term aim is the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, the breaking apart of the alliance between the United States and, and South Korea, as well as with Japan. And that's, that's one not of the realistic. Uh, if, if he has a nuclear capability to hit the United States, it is at least possible that they can convince the South Koreans that it has to break ties because Will the United States sacrifice Chicago for Seoul? Will we actually go to war if we know that the North Koreans can hit us? This is the same thing but that happened during the Cold War. the culture that the South Koreans have developed, which is, for lack of a better term, very Americanized, uh, it, it, the South Koreans aren't going to buy that, are they? Well, remember, you had a war in the 1950s. Um, if, if, if I'm the North Koreans and I see that the United States is going to be marginalized, then the ability for me to impose my military will on the South becomes at least more plausible. And if I am someone like Kim Jong-un, who grew up being told he was a god, and you can never make any errors, and I'm more likely to use the military option once I know that I've gotten the United States checkmate. And that's a worst case scenario, but it's a scenario Trump we have to look at. making notes on this? One would hope. And I know Secretary of Defense Mattis. Calling that guy a sick is. puppy. I mean, you, you very formally, I think, uh, you know, one could say that you more or less have called him a sick puppy here without having done it. That's called diplomacy, professionalism, being articulate, all those things. Uh, how long It's like a broken record. Us talk, we talking about him and his rhetoric, referring to him as a sick puppy. Um, how is that helping? It's not. And l let's be precise. He is not a, a sick puppy. He is not an insane man. But he is, and I've said this before, an evil man with evil intent. Uh, this is a person who allowed 10%, his uh, father anyway, allowed 10% of his population to die of abject starvation because he wanted to devote all of his resources to the nuclear program and the military. So this is a group of individuals who have been in control of North Korea for decades and decades who are bad people with ill intent. Okay, so what are we doing here? Nikki Haley, you saw the package there at the top. Our uh, ambassador to the UN is suggesting that, you know, if we go to war, North Korea's regime no longer exists. Well, it seems to me that means, you know, we take them out. We're going to take them out through high tech conventional means, though, correct? Well, the language she's using is the classic language of nuclear deterrence, which says, if you attack us, we will respond with an overwhelming attack 
to destroy your country. But I'm not hearing if you attack us. I'm hearing if you keep testing. If you keep testing, we're going to take you out anyway. Is that true? Well, I wouldn't know what's in the mind of uh, the president. Uh, but oh, there is God, something. You actually responded to that by suggesting that a single person, meaning Donald Trump, has, holds all the cards in this, is horrifying. The fact that he's commander in chief, and then he carries around, or his his aide carries around the, you know, the nuclear missile codes, uh, means that he has the ability to do so. Now he has great people around him, the Secretary of Defense, uh, his chief of staff, uh, General Kelly. These are very responsible people. However, if the President of the United States decides that it is necessary for a preemptive strike, one would think he would use conventional. However, the North Koreans have dispersed their nuclear program throughout the country in deep, uh, hardened silos, and they have a missile capability that's mobile now, so that you do not not sure where it's going to be because it could be moving at any time. Uh, so it's problematic to use conventional weapons, even our big bunker buster bombs, our, you know, the Moab and our bunker buster daisy bombs, which are meant to go in ground and then explode, very, very powerful weapons that still does not guarantee you'll hit every one of the targets. And any conventional effort will give them plenty of time to react to South Korea. Yes. And hold Seoul, which is, what, 30, 40 miles from the demilitarized zone, no, less hostage. Yeah. And not only that, it's not just conventional artillery that he has or missiles. He also has chem and bio weapons. Um, and you wouldn't put it past him to use you know, chemical and biological weapons. So you're talking about a potential of hundreds of thousands. The whole thing feels like a checkmate. The whole thing feels like, you know, and, and I think most Americans, if they really studied this, would really start to freak out. And I wonder, when we come back, we'll talk about this. I, I, you feel powerless, don't you, in some ways? We just elected a president who holds all the cards. So what can we do about this next? All right, so the conundrum for people watching this show is, what do you do about this? And, and, and the second part of the question is, even those who voted for Donald Trump and the alleged core of 35 to 38 percent that still thinks no matter what he does, he's the disruptor, he's the guy, da-da-da. When they listen carefully to what you have laid out here, I wonder what their confidence level really is in he being a sensible, thoughtful, practical person in this dynamic with North Korea? Well, every president who's ever held an office say that the office changes them in a profound manner. That the incredible responsibility, uh, the, the knowledge that, particularly in the 20th and 21st century, that you have the fate of the world in your hands, uh, makes even someone who may be transparently superficial at least a little more thoughtful. And also, I can sleep at night because I know that the people surrounding the president are thoughtful people who will counsel the president to act prudently. Well, we've had some military discussion out there regarding uh, whether or not military discretion would supersede a president's order. Thought on that? Uh, ultimately, the president has the power to call for a nuclear strike. Um, and in fact, if on one level it is rejected, he can go beyond that level. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it's ultimately the president's decision. It is possible, however, if his counselors uh, thought he was acting too erratically, that they could stop it from occurring before it begins. But it's where does, problematic. Where does Tillerson come into this? As we speak on Thursday, lots of, uh, you know, the president would call it fake news, but the uh, New York Times has got some pretty solid reporting. Uh, that's a political headline, but it really is kind of New York Times at the beginning, uh, suggesting that uh, Tillerson is out the door come holidays. Uh, what do you think? Well, from my uh, connections at state and uh, defense, he's been marginalized in the last six months significantly. He even tweets that say, don't worry about it, Rex. You know, don't bother with Kim Jong. You know, we'll take care of this. I mean, well, I, I don't see, 
at, at a glance, you think that it's some kind of strategery, you know? I don't, I don't see it as, as deep thinking. I, don't, I, I see it as just off-the-cuff Twitter chatter from the president. I actually really feel bad for the Secretary of State because he was undercut from the outset. Uh, he was told that he needed to cut and make substantial cuts to the Department of State uh, by the very first week he was in. Uh, For and the that, purposes of economic discipline or, or, or just uh, ideological strategy? Well, I think it was mostly ideological strategy. Look, the Department of State is one of the smallest departments in the U.S. government with one of the biggest missions. The fact that we're cutting it at a time when we're under siege uh, with the potential with North Korea and we're involved in Africa and in South, South Asia and the Middle East, it's absurd. We, we have need the, diplomats. We, we have the talent for the diplomacy, correct? Absolutely. We have enough fertile talent, minds like yours, that are completely up to date, able to navigate the world issues, report back, negotiate, keep things at bay, all that stuff. We have the talent. It's not that we don't. It's not that there are vacancies that we can't fill. They've just decided that this centric thinking president wants to wants to consolidate the kind of diplomacy that the state has done for a long time into the White House? You know, it's really sad because, look. Is that what it is? Uh, it, it, it could be. Um, it also could be because we want to get rid of the Obama leftovers so that we have a pure State Department that represents our views, and many administrations tend to do that. Uh, but look, a state has within its arsenal not just the military component, but economic, diplomatic, political. If you are going to take and disarm yourself with one of your key parts of your power, then you're weakening the country. You've got to instead make that make sure the Department of State is strong and Does vital. Does Trump just view it as too many cooks in his own kitchen? Is that what he, I, I don't understand the philosophy. I think it's an ideological mission to wipe the State Department of liberals whom the administration disagrees with. He's had some really peculiar behavior uh, this week, uh, has he bubbled up to more concern for you at all? He has always been a significant. First of all, my views represent myself and Correct. not the Department We've, of Navy. We always say that at the beginning. <laughs> we should have said that at the beginning. Uh, we only have a half minute, so you can't do too much damage. But are, are you more worried this week? I am worried that he hasn't matured in the job, and I'm, I'm more worried that he hasn't tempered himself and applied more discipline to his rhetoric. And the idea that he would say that the, uh, you know, the bus tape, you know, that got him all jammed up might be fake, that kind of, that kind of, it's got nothing to do with this, but that kind of logic, do you think it, it reflects on his ability to handle this? I think it reflects poorly on his ability. Okay. How come you always come in and impress <laughs> us and depress us at the same time? It's a gift. It is. <laughs> Happy holidays. Happy uh, well, we probably be back before. Uh, but it's, we got a lot to, 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 to worry about. All right. Uh, last word when we come back. Stay with us. <laughs>